So thanks for the patience. Um, as you see, we are tape recorded. Um, interesting experience, probably. We stopped here with uh, this figure. And I was trying to explain those three premises, but I hadn't talked about how these three premises break down into six um, hypotheses before I'm doing this. I want to walk you through another picture. This is figure one one in the book. You find it on page 44. And this is supposed to be an overview over the entire human empowerment framework. And the framework itself is always consisting of three pillars. Um, on the left, we talked about it already, existential conditions. In the middle, psychological orientation as to prevent in a population. So it's not so much about the uh, psychological orientations of single individuals, but of the overall collective mentality in which patterns prevail. Right? So some people talked about this in previous times about national character, in quotation marks. So you don't use this term anymore because it has genetic undertones that we don't want to have. And on the right hand side, the third pillar is institutional regulations. And the human empowerment framework argues that empowering conditions have to appear in all three of them in order to make this whole concept complete. And when it comes to existential conditions, the most important part is resources. So things that people can control, command, are in their possession. And the argument is when they have these things, they can do more things at will. And that means that the action radius, the types of activities you can perform, increases. When you have more money, you have better consumer options and investment options. If you know more, you can do more things because you know the laws and you know you are entitled to do this and then you will do it probably. If you have more connections to other people, you can also join forces more easily and touch base with each other, for instance, for a social movement that starts a political campaign, right? So therefore, I make a distinction between three types of action resources. Material, like income, commodities, equipment. Um, intellectual, that is skills, education, knowledge, problem-solving capacities, thinking capacity, basically and connected resources, which are all the technologies that make it easier for us to touch base with like-minded others for a common purpose. So those three are the key action resources. And you can imagine that in older societies, people had little of this. In terms of material resources, people were usually poor, 99% of our history. In terms of intellectual resources, people, most people were illiterate. In terms of connective resources, people were cut off from each other, only in the local communities they could meet. But you could not connect with someone uh, several kilometers or miles away. Mm -hmm. And this has changed through modernization. On all three accounts, people's resources have grown. And that means individuals <laughs> today are more powerful than they used to be over most of our past. So action resources. And when we have them, they operate on people's capabilities to exercise freedoms. And when that happens, the utility of freedoms is growing. But if you move one step to the right and look at psychological orientations, this is exactly where the emancipative values are becoming important. And I told you before, I see them consisting of two components. Um, that people appreciate independence of their choice, of the life choices they make, whether it's small decisions or big decisions, or political decisions like casting a vote in an election. So, an appreciation of independence of choice and an appreciation of uh, equality of opportunities. Note, this is not equality in outcomes. People accept that people who invest different motivation and different skills will end up with less, with different amounts of income and money. That is accepted. But everyone should have equal opportunities to bring in their motivations and skills. And when these two come together, we have emancipative values. Uh, as I said, an egalitarian component and a libertarian component come together here. These are the values of the environment. 
And when they are growing, we can talk about that the motivations, so not the capabilities, the motivations to exercise freedoms is now growing. And this is not working on the utility of freedoms, but on the value of freedoms, which is a subjective thing. Um, um, so we can, in a sense, when emancipatory values are growing, we can talk about psychological empowerment. When action resources are growing, we can talk about instrumental or existential empowerment. And then comes the, the next part, uh, institutional regulations. And this is about the civic entitlements that the residents of a country have. And if you compare countries, it can be anything between North Korea, where there's no entitlements to anything. People, even when they leave the village or city, have to ask for a visa to travel in their own country. They have no entitlements. And then you have countries like Switzerland or Sweden, where the entitlements are at the maximum of what we know today. Of course, this is historically evolving. Uh, it can get more, of course. There is no necessary upper limit. And then I make a distinction when it comes to the civic entitlements about, mm, this goes back to philosopher Isaiah Berlin, like the German capital city of Berlin, since last name, and he talked about negative freedom and positive freedom. He made this distinction. And uh, negative freedom is, so to speak, freedom from. That means uh, freedoms that protect my personal autonomy from outside infringement into my personal sphere. This is about personal decisions that people are allowed to make, like to, to decide who to marry or where to live in a country, where to move and this kind of thing, which career to plan or pursue. Uh, so this is negative freedom. They establish autonomy or personal autonomy rights. But then we also have, uh, well, negative freedoms are also important for one point that is important for liberal democracies. Um, countries that institutionalize personal freedoms through doing this, they institutionalize also limited government. So democracy is also about limited government. Governments cannot just do everything, even if there is a majority. There is limits what government is allowed to do. And this personal autonomy here sets limits. Um, because it would be actually imaginable that even in a democracy you get some totalitarian economic regime that regulates everything uh, to an extent that we are narrower and narrower in our personal autonomy. So these are very important. And then we have uh, positive freedoms is not freedom from, but freedom to. So here comes the second element. I must also, in order to be empowered as a citizen, I must also be allowed to step out of my personal sphere and enter the public space and have their rights of co-determination or participation. Like freedom of association, freedom of assembly, uh, the right to found a party or political movement. Dominic. Yeah. Then again, uh... The, the positive and negative uh, freedoms sometimes uh, like create a paradox because uh, someone's uh, negative freedom, like uh, so freedom from something, uh, can be an infringement of uh, someone's uh, positive freedom. So like uh, someone cannot uh, do something, so they don't have this positive freedom to do something because of someone's negative uh, freedom from this thing. Like for example, uh, like this will be a stupid example, but uh, a freedom from having your apartment flooded uh, because uh, like is kind of an infringement on uh, someone's uh, uh, on someone's uh, positive freedom uh, to use as much water as, uh, as they want to. Actually, this is true. So the two can come into conflict. And actually, we have currently an example. Um, as far as I know, Polish farmers are blocking um, the highway at the German border. And that, uh, so they take, they claim their positive freedom to do this, uh, but others um, cannot use uh, um, the highway and, and uh, so infringe in their, in their negative freedom. So it will always be a balancing act. Uh, so when that might, 
go in this or in this direction. So this will be a balancing act. But it is important that both types of freedom are existing and are brought in the balance of each other. One balancing principle could be, and we had a sad discussion in Germany because German farmers were also with their tractors blocking uh, streets and, uh, and for a couple of days and also um, putting waste on the streets and stuff like this. Um, one principle could be that my right for um, positive freedom can only go so, go so far as an other one's negative freedom is not curtailed. This would be John Mill's harm principle, that you have freedom only in so far as you do not harm with the use of that freedom, the freedom of others, which should be equally considered. Mm -hmm. So this is a balancing act for sure. But I think we need to consider uh, both types of freedoms or rights. And when they come together, we have civic entitlements. And this is now not working on capabilities, on also not on motivation, but basically on the license or guarantees. So it's a legal, a legal thing. In this sense, we can then talk about institutional empowerment. So we have instrumental empowerment with action resources. We have psychological empowerment with emancipated bodies, and we have um, institutional empowerment with civic entitlements. And this is exactly where democracy kicks in, because I think the most important point about democracy is that it empowers citizens through entitlements and rights. Um, so this is uh, working, um, so we get it all together, utility, value, license. And when those come together, we can talk about human empowerment in a more comprehensive sense. And the interesting thing is we have measures of all of these three things. And we can then look um, how countries are advancing and how they are in comparison with each other and do these comparisons and then look further into research what we can find out about trends uh, in human empowerment. Um, this is, a, this is a more simple summary of the figure from before, uh, but a slightly different take on it. Um, when it comes to action resources, so if you think of human empowerment as a whole, as a package, uh, when I talk about action resources, it would be the hardware. Uh, if we talk about advanced values, it would be the software. And if we talk about uh, civic entitlements, it would be um, the license component for the whole package, to use that little bit metaphorical language. Now I go back um, to these six, um, six pieces here. So the left-hand one, syndrome, syndrome thesis, um, could also call it package thesis. What it um, wants to say is that these three elements of human empowerment uh, action resources, emancipative values, civic, civic entitlements, they always tend to come together. That means countries that are low on one of the three components also tend to be low on the other two, and vice versa. And countries that tend to be high in one of the three components tend to be high on the other two as well. And countries that are mediocre on one component tend to be mediocre on the others as well. That means between these three elements is a, a tendency towards consistency or coherence, that they are congruent with each other on either consistently low, middle, or, or high levels. That is what the syndrome thesis um, says. The next one is the sequence thesis. This makes a, a slightly different argument. The sequence thesis says, says yes, um, these three elements tend to go together in compatible ways. But this compatibility comes through a certain causal sequence, and it starts with action resources. And on the basis of action resources, emancipated values grow. And on the basis of emancipated values, civic entitlements grow. Well, this is the causal direction between these three elements. It's not going back and forth. Maybe there are feedback loops, loops as well, so that the, these elements reinforce each other, but the main sequence should be resources, values, entitlements. 
so that the process of democratization usually happens when the other two elements have already uh, are already in place, and then democracy is kind of a legal crowning achievement for the whole process, and then it can start again to spiral up, starting with resources. Um, the solidarity thesis is the next one. This is a little bit uh, difficult to explain. What I want to say with this thesis is that um, the utilities um, that lie in resources, what is important here is joint utility, so it's a collective thing, not the individual utilities. We see this later in regressions where we would see, um, generally speaking, people, individuals, who are more prosperous, more educated, and better connected, those people as individuals would show stronger emancipative values. But what is important about this resource part, it is not so important what people have more than others in their society, but what is more important is that many people have a lot, so they should be joined and shared utilities, and then we have shared values, and this gives people we would see it in a regression, for instance, you could look, um, are people's emancipated values pushed more by their own income or by the fact that the whole society has a high average level, when the average level is more important than what an individual herself has. So it's a collective argument, much more than, a, than, a, than an individualistic argument. Um, the source thesis argues that the first difference from which the emancipatory process, the human empowerment process, where it started, it started in, uh, with the Industrial Revolution in England, or more generally speaking, in Northwestern Europe. And Northwestern Europe has a uh, a very particular, you make this argument in the final chapter, fi almost fi second final chapter. Um, this Northwestern European uh, geography has particular climatic features from which we believe that they made the first difference. These features we call it cool water or the cool water condition. What it basically means is you have um, seasonal change between summer and winter. But winters are not so harsh, like in Siberia, and summers are usually re relatively cool uh, without enduring heat peaks. Then you have certain water patterns because you have constant precipitation. There is no dry season in these cool water areas, which are very strongly focusing on northwestern Europe, which is the area of the British Islands, uh, southern Scandinavia. Um, Northern Germany, uh, Northern France, the Netherlands, and then we'll go into the Baltics as well. So this would be um, the, the most pronounced cool water region. Um, and it does a lot of things already in medieval times uh, when society is getting uh, settled and then make a transition to agriculture and when, when the state starts to, to, to develop. Uh, when this happens under cool water conditions, it happens under circumstances that um, guide the state building process in a completely different direction than it happened elsewhere in the world, uh, in other civilizations outside of the West. When you look at state building processes in, for instance, the Middle East, you can think of Mesopotamia, Egypt, uh, the Indian empires and the Chinese empires. This was always a coercive process. It was top down uh, with the creation of hierarchies and actually by disempowering ordinary people and making them uh, slaves, peasants, and all kinds of uh, not so nice things. And this had a lot to do with uh, Karl Wittfogel, a German anthropologist called the Hydraulic Society. I've probably never heard this uh, term, Hydraulic Societies. He figured out that all the major early civilizations um, emerged in river delta settings. So the Nile in Egypt is probably the biggest paragon. The Yellow River in China, the Indus River in India, 
So these early civilizations came up or emerged uh, along uh, alluvial deltas and, and river streams. And Wittfogel argued when agriculture um, kicks in in such settings, what you need is a lot of irrigation work. Um, irrigation uh, in turn requires a lot of work and it has to be coordinated because you need infrastructure. You need to build the infrastructure and you have to maintain the infrastructure. And for that, you need mass labor. And someone has to coordinate the labor. You have to build all the time dikes, canals, bridges, locks, um, all kinds of features that belong to irrigated agriculture. And then you get a, a, an early trend into centralized power structure with a clear chain of command and with a managerial class. And on top of the managerial class is a central emperor with his um, uh, imperial court. And you get a very hierarchical, um, autocratic uh, structure. And especially when this is then stretching over wide territories, like in Egypt, with a, several thousand miles along the Nile River. Um, yeah, agrarian empires, basically speaking. And these are coercive states, all of them. Uh, and state building was always connected with tax extraction, tax collection, and building a standing army, a professional army, which usually has not only been used for defense from outside enemies, but also for oppression of opposition in the own population. Um, that was, and therefore, what the state building process was coercive. Now, think of this cool water area in Northwestern Europe. Cool water means that you have all the time rain. And every piece of land where you clear the woods or drain a swamp, and you have uh, sufficiently good soil, you can um, pursue agriculture everywhere. And you don't need irrigation. And if you don't need irrigation, you actually take the tool away from elites to erect power over people because no one can control, centrally control the supply of water. And no one can be deprived from access to water when it rains at every spot most of the time. Um, that also means that the value of land is, is diffuse. Land is valuable everywhere, and not only because it's at the river shore. Um, and all these kinds of things. And that means in such a setting, um, any economy that develops can only work by decentral management of water, land, and people. Decentral management of water, land, and people. And that means you also get a lot of local autonomies. And if you look back into medieval Europe, there were so many voluntary associations, private organizations, people voluntarily joining them, fraternities, sororities, merchant guilds, think of the Hanseatic League, which was a private organization, Think of the East India companies, whether the Dutch or the English one, all private organizations. And if now in such a setting, um, central rulers, kings, want to start to build a state, what they want to do is, of course, tax people and use the taxes to fund a civil service, a bureaucracy to collect further taxes and to build a professional army, also to oppress people uh, in a worst case scenario. But here in this setting, when rulers were confronted with so many voluntary associations, these voluntary associations were actually practiced in self government, self administration. And they could, of course, then they had the skill to organize effective resistance against uh, authoritarian impositions from above. And what we got were the, were the liberal revolutions of the 16th and 17th century. And when rulers tried to overtax, they, they were expelled. They even beheaded in two cases. Uh, Louis of France and Charles of England were beheaded because they uh, were too, too uh, tyrannic in the eyes of, uh, of especially the bourgeoisie. Dominic, yeah, that's... No, that's not a problem. No. Okay, so this is um, the source thesis says that certain features, um, climatic features, um, explain the first difference when this emancipatory dynamic kicked in. Um, the second last one here, which I call the fertility thesis, argues that one of the mechanisms by which the cool water condition helped to trigger 
emancipatory dynamics with rights struggles um, was lower fertility in these areas. Um, that had at least two reasons why fertility was, I mean, let me put it like this, in, in pre-industrial times, fertilities were high everywhere under nowadays standards. Yeah? But still, existed, there existed already differences before the Industrial Revolution brought the fertility transition towards very low fertilities today. And um, these differences are partly explained with the cool water condition, for one. Um, the type of agriculture that was performed under in cool water areas was usually um, rye or wheat growing and cattle herding. And this type of agriculture, especially when you think about it, so the, the proverbial family farm in medieval times was usually a couple with two kids, heavy iron plow and two horses to pull that heavy plow. Such a family farm could work a considerable stretch of land completely on their own with no need for extended family support um, and all, no, not much need for child labor. In other words, this form of agriculture is particularly, uh, it's not labor, not very labor intense. Uh, for cattle herding, it's even more so, and cattle herding was favored because these um, climates here create very lush uh, grass and pastures, so you can herd the cows very easily, and that is even less labor intense, but land intense. And the, 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 the difference becomes obvious, especially when you compare this type of agriculture with uh, rice paddy farming, which is super labor intense. Um, and you can see how many uh, armies of uh, farm workers are deployed to settle the seeds of rice, uh, and you really need many people to do the work. In, in Northwestern Europe, you did not need many people. And that means the, the pressure to uh, increase the size of the workforce was relatively low. And that means that pressure to maximize the number of children for this reason was also relatively low. There's another one. And um, we have data already back to medieval times about disease load in different areas of the world. So how many communicable diseases do exist in a certain area? And that of course maps also on the climate pattern because in the tropics, there is just the list of communicable diseases is much longer. Uh, with malaria, dengue fever, yellow fever, bilharziosis, and, and all kinds of things that did not exist in, in Northwestern Europe. Doesn't mean there were no epidemics. There was the Black Death uh, that killed half of the population in some areas, if not even more. But it was just, relatively speaking, it was a lower list. And therefore, child mortality was also somewhat, well, not much, but somewhat significantly lower in cool water areas than where else. And that is also an, an element that takes away pressure to maximize the number of, of children. And therefore, according to the data that we have, of course, these are estimates. Um, the number of births, for instance, in Denmark or in northern France per woman, on average, was four to five. In other world areas, it was seven, eight, nine. So about half of what, of what you would find in other areas of the world. So therefore, lower fertility pressure, and we know from the de demographers, the uh, demographers who are doing their research, uh, lower fertility always means that you are more on a quality building rather than quantity breeding strategy of reproductive behavior, meaning that parents invest more in the skills of, of themselves and their children than in their number. And that is an important um, element because it means that human capital is enriched from an early point in time. And also we think that the, this Northwestern European drive towards individualism was also due to your lower fertility rates and more human capital building. And therefore, the fertility increases are ideas exactly what I just said. Then comes the last one. Uh, the contagion thesis, 
argues that this process of dropping fertility and rising school rates is diffusing all over the world. It's also related to increasing life expectancies, which in turn means that people's, not only their actual lifespan is expanding, but also their time horizon is expanding. And that might make something of the human mind because you plan for much longer and you invest into things that have, as economists say, a delay of gratification. Education is exactly such a thing because you reap the harvest of the time you invest in right now here at university somewhat later when you have your degree and, and your um, a, a career. So in order to do this, you need to be able to think with a certain future um, orientation and that future orientation comes with a longer time span in terms of our life expectancy. And what it also does, and we see it all over the world, emancipated values are growing also because of this, because when pe people now want of expect more from their life, they want out more of life, have higher aspirations than previous generations. So the, the, the standard of expectations of aspirations is higher, and that is a, a push factor for uh, emancipated values. So this is basically the overview of, of the theory, and to the um, reminder of, um, of our semester, um, you will then see the data that fill those ideas with evidence. <clears throat> okay, and one more theory, a bit more theory before we uh, look into data. Um, this is figure one, two, from page uh, 53. Um, what it tries to do is to show that societies can be in two opposite equilibria. Uh, the left hand one is, uh, is the, the vicious one, that is the disempowering equilibrium, and it means scarcity, conformity, and oppression, or poverty, conformity, and oppression. And the opposite one is the empowered equilibrium, and it means prosperity, emancipation, and liberty. The thing is that both equilibria exist uh, in a stable fashion and are kind of reinforcing themselves. Um, although they go through the same mechanisms, the same sequence of mechanisms, just in opposite direction. Mm -hmm. So, these are the mechanisms and they just go in opposite ways. So, um, when we have pressing existential conditions, that means uh, few or scarce action resources. People have few connections, few material needs, and little education. Um, and in the opposite, you have permissive existential conditions when action resources are truly widespread. And now from here, the same things happen, but in contrary ways. First, there is evaluation mechanism. In the, in the bad case, so to speak, this means that people recognize the low utility of freedoms and accordingly don't value freedoms that highly because they see they have very little utility for them. And that means that our emancipatory drives, they remain dormant. Yeah. In the opposite case, people recognize a high utility of freedoms and value them accordingly. That means they appreciate them. And that means emancipated values awaken from hibernation. So that's the valuation mechanism. Then comes the activation mechanism. Here we have weak emancipated values. And in this situation, people take no or little action to enforce entitlements and freedoms. In the opposite case, when emancipated values are strong, people do take action to, um, to um, enforce entitlements and freedoms. And then comes the satisfaction mechanism, because people usually um, obtain satisfaction from the actions the, they are um, undertaking. And in the, in the bad case, 
people obtain little satisfaction from asserting an exercise in freedoms. And that means that the, the mobilization capacity uh, of the society and of human creativity makes weak in this scenario. And here we have the opposite. People obtain much satisfaction from asserting an exercise in freedoms. And then you have a society with a strong mobilization of human creativities and energies. And then, of course, in this scenario, I get a system with a high capacity of collective regulation. And in this situation, I get a system with weak, with weak capacities. And that now feeds back on the weak system capacities. Action resources remain scarce. Under strong system capacities, it feeds back and action resources um, grow and spread out. So these both equilibrium are self and reinforcing um, until they meet each other. Um, until when a society that is in this equilibrium meets a society that is that is, that is in this equilibrium, I will see a power distance. And the society on the right hand equilibrium is more powerful than the one on the left. And that explains why Europe has colonized the world and not the other way around. Because Northwestern Europe was on this right hand side equilibrium in other parts of the world on the left hand side equilibrium. That didn't make much uh, to this here um, because they were not confronted with colonial powers until it happened. But then these agrarian empires, which seemingly were power powerful because of the imperial courts, uh, were so impressive for European observers like Mark Polo. Uh, but in fact, the states that they had were actually not that powerful and had not really good capacities when you looked or compared it with the fiscal, uh, technocratic, uh, organizational, and military capacities that the European uh, nation states um, developed, don't we? And I, that also explains why uh, many like, local states, uh, local rulers, and so on, were, uh, instead of being fully conquered, uh, they were uh, most of the time vassalized by the European mm -hmm. colonizers. Like, for example, when uh, the British were uh, colonizing uh, India, uh, like, when they, uh, they were getting to the end of uh, conquering uh, India, uh, they only vassalized the, the Sikh empire. Mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, their court, their rulers, and so on were prestigious, were seen as uh, very, uh, very impressive uh, by the people of India, mm -hmm. and so uh, they could be used as a symbol of this time. Yeah, they were very. The British were relatively skillful uh, in this uh, what they called indirect rule, uh, and right. using the local using the local elites uh, as a uh, as a tool. Of, of enforcement, I would totally agree with that, indeed. Okay, any other questions so far? We're actually a little uh, ahead, of, ahead of time. Um, so, let me see what trying to start here. Okay, then um, I start already with the next session. Yeah. And now we go more into empirical uh, work and want to fill with evidence what we have talked about. So, here we see how emancipative values are measured uh, based on the data from the World Value Survey and the European Value Study. Um, I can tell you it's about four subtopics. Um, I call it one, you could choose different names, of course. The one I call choice for people's, uh, no choice, equality, voice, autonomy. So choice is, is when people are, this is about questions about sexual self-determination. And here we have questions that go like this. Um, here follows a list of behaviors and attitudes that people might have. Please me for tell me for each of them uh, whether you think it is never justifiable or always justifiable. Please use the scale from one to 10 where one means never justifiable 
and tech means always justifiable. And on this list come things like abortion, divorce, and homosexuality. So this is about sexual um, self-determination or reproductive freedom. Um, three items again, abortion, divorce, homosexuality. Equality, the next one. Um, here we have questions uh, where we've asked the respondent, okay, please tell me how much you agree with the following statements. And one of them says, when well, jobs are scarce, education is more, no, jobs are more important for a boy than for a man. The same for education, uh, more important for male than for female. And the same for politics. Uh, the one statement says, men make better political leaders than women, period. And then people can agree or disagree with that. Of course, the emancipatory answer is to disagree uh, with these things and be in favor of equality between the sexes, gender equality. So, three items about sexual self-determination choice, three items about women's equality to men, equality, and then come three items that are about um, how a country should be governed and uh, how much of a role the voice of the people should play. So, this question goes like, all, like this. Um, um, the government must always uh, take certain priorities. Please tell me uh, on the following list which you think is the most important one to prioritize and which is the second most important one to prioritize. And they are confronted with fear with the four statements. Um, maintaining order in the nation, fighting rising prices, uh, protecting freedom of speech, and giving people more say in important government decisions. And what we looked at here is whether people prioritize freedom of speech and giving people more say. And we summarize this under voice. Um, and autonomy, again, another set of three items. This is about desired child qualities. Um, this question goes like this. Um, here comes a list with possible uh, child qualities that you might or might not want to educate into your children or to socialize your children to. And then come things like uh, discipline, diligence, faith, obedience, creativity, so on and so forth. And here we code it as emancipatory answers where people said independence is an important child quality and when imagination is an important child quality, and when obedience is not an important child quality. So this is the autonomy aspect. Now, um, a problem with these things is they are all measured on different scales. Some of these questions have um, confronted respondents with a 10-point scale, like a thermometer. Um, others give them four agreement, disagreement options with a middle category that is neutral. Others give them four response options, and still other questions give them five response options. So I cannot directly compare these numbers then. So what we did is that in total it's 12 items from different questions. So what we did before we did any summary, uh, we calculated these items in such a manner that zero is always the least or most anti-emancipatory uh, option and 1.0 is always the most emancipatory option and then you get fractions in between. Yeah? Someone who is undecided gets a 0.5 or something. Yeah? It's in the middle of the scale. Uh, sometimes who gets a 0.75 is clearly more emancipatory than not, but not at the top of the, of the list yet. Uh, of, uh, someone who has 0.25 is uh, rather at the lower end, but not completely at the lower end. So this is how we then interpret these numbers. And every individual that has answered these questions gets a score. Simply by adding up, so each item, 12 of them, scored from 0 to 1, and then we add them up. Now we can do that because the scales are standardized. And then divide the score by 12, and then 
every individual has a score between 0 and 1.0. And since we summarize quite a number of items, 12 in total, uh, the scales get really fine-grained. You know? It's not like there are no, only three numbers or so. It's, it can be anything, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and so on. This is one thing we do. Um, the other thing that we do is that we um, average the entire population. So what's the score of the entire population on the scale from 0 to 1.0? Of course, uh, when you uh, calculate population averages, it's almost impossible that the population has an average of 1.0 because that uh, theoretically is possible, but uh, under all practical considerations, it's almost impossible because it would mean that among 2,000 respondents that we have in Poland, every single individual would have on all 12 questions answered always the most emancipatory option possible. Um, that is unlikely. Um, it is also unlikely that you find any society that is completely at zero because that would mean that all respondents, 1,500, 2,000, or how many we have, would always have given the least emancipatory option uh, in all those questions. And that is highly unlikely that this happens. Individuals differ um, in every society. Uh, maybe uh, one thing before. Uh, the, so the World Value Survey, go, and so far we have uh, surveyed 100 countries around the world on all continents. Um, uh, but we represent more than 90% of the world population because we go always for the population richest countries on a given uh, continent. So if we do the survey in Latin America, of course, we look for Brazil, Argentina, and Mexico. When we do the survey in South Sudan, Africa, Nigeria is the biggest population of 200 million people. If we do the survey in Asia, of course, we go for India and China and Japan and other uh, population rich societies like Indonesia has also 250 million people. So those are important countries to cover. Therefore, even though we have only half of the states covered in the world, it is nevertheless more than 90% of the population. And it is our rule or equation that we put it like this, that these um, surveys are representative. So that the numbers we get, we can really make inference how the population as a whole um, is ticking. And therefore, we follow the roots of uh, survey research and opinion polling and that we get representative samples uh, from, from those countries. And not only the citizens, but the residents. So that would include migrants, for example. And we start from 16 plus, mm -hmm. uh, the population starting 16 years of age plus and no upper age limit. Um, so that's the ambition. And how do we do this? Yeah, you get representative samples if you do a proper random sample. So no quota sample, but random sample. Um, in a country like um, the US, for instance, you can go on the residential register and draw by a, a, a random generator um, a number of addresses. If you want to interview 4,000 people in the United States and you know that you will get a response rate that only every second person will do the interview, meaning a response rate for 50%, then you cannot draw 4,000 addresses, but you have to draw 8,000 addresses in order to realize 4,000 interviews in a way. So a little bit of experience with response rates is also important. And you can imagine that this is a huge, uh, a big enterprise. And we're doing this service every five years. And we have, of course, to organize the funding for this and the uh, subcontract opinion poll agencies in those countries, uh, in many African countries, or there is chains like Gallup. So they do a lot of service in Africa for us. And we have, of course, to, uh, to pay uh, the interviewers. And therefore, we have to apply for funding with uh, the normal donor organizations. In Germany, for instance, it's the German Science Foundation who gave us funding in the last round of surveys. Just to give you a, a hunch, uh, on how costly this is. Only Germany, uh, with 2,000 uh, representatively selected respondents, um, the price tag that we got from InfraTest, which is the German uh, polling organization who did it, was uh, 450,000 euros. So now you can project this to 100 countries in the world. Of course, in low income countries, it's uh, less expensive. Many African countries only cost 50,000. 
um, here or so, but it's nevertheless it's a big um, a big project uh, where we get those that data. Um, simply because it was so important in theoretical discussions, we have another set of values in this in this data, which is also a composite index. And this is now about secular values. And we have taken this in because there's so much research in uh, sociology, but also in political science on the role of religion. And secular values are the opposite. So it's, we call it actually sacred versus the secular values. And in a sense, psychologically speaking, we would consider what we call secular values um, um, kind of a precursor to a man's of values. Uh, what does it mean? We think that psychologically speaking, um, you have to adopt secular, secular values first before you can internalize emancipative values. Why is this the case? Mm, my reasoning is, is as follows. When you look at these secular values, they center strongly on religion, but religion is only one source of external authority over people. Um, Ronald Engelhardt always was talking about God, Father, and the Fatherland. So other external sources of authority besides religion are, of course, the nation and also the family and group norms. And what we try to measure with these secular values is a distance of individuals to external sources of authority over their life. And that means a distance to, to religion a distance to the nation, a distance to group pressures, a distance to uh, a patriarchal family role model where you only live to make your parents proud. So distanciation from external sources of authority. And we think you have to do this first before you can internalize the authority over your life into the self. The latter is exactly what emancipative values are doing. When people adopt emancipative values, they internalize the authority over their life into the self. Before you can do that, you have to distance yourself from other external sources of authority. And that is what secular values are measuring. Therefore, again, we think first you must internalize secular, and then only then you can internalize emancipative values. Now, how did we measure this? We also, it's kind of a parallel construction to the other, again, for subtopics. Um, defiance means people are low, uh, place a low priority on parents' pride. So the, we have a question, um, um, how do you stay, um, think about the following statement? I live my life only to make my parents proud. Um, a secular position is when a person disagrees with that. Uh, this is a distance from family authority. Um, defiance also means to be low on national pride and uh, a rejection for a higher respect of authority. That's what we call defiance. Agnosticism is more, more center, central on religion. Um, we have a question where people are asked um, how important the following areas of life are for them. And religion is one of them. And we quote this as a secular position when a person says religion is unimportant for herself. Um, when the person does not go to religious practice, and when the person says she or he is not a religious person, that is agnosticism. Then we have relativism. And this is a, a question about um, acceptance of behavior. Here it's about bribery, cheating, and tax evasion. And we call it as relativism when people do not um, um, strongly position themselves on those questions, but are kind of shrugging their shoulders and place themselves in the middle. So it depends on the, the, the situation. Yeah. Uh, usually it would, uh, because we have seen, uh, therefore these, these questions are a bit tricky to interpret for the following reason. 
um, the, or the, the, the original idea to ask this acceptance of bribery, uh, cheating on taxes, and uh, what's the other? Bribery, cheating on taxes, and tax evasion. The acceptance of this was when these items were invented. The idea was to see how much um, moral civicness there is. And the assumption was the more people reject such behaviors, the more civic minded they are. Meaning that a high rejection rate of those uh, sins uh, would mean a healthy mental climate in the society. Then, however, you discover that the highest rejection rates come from countries like, for instance, Russia, while the Finns um, are kind of undecided on those things. No, not, not such a clear rejection. And this is exactly what you say. We have then to reinterpret these response patterns as actually not uh, as a civic quality when the number is high, but as a reflection of the problem situation in the society. And many Russians reject it, even though they themselves probably are involved in, in corruption activities, because they know it's an endemic problem in their country. And then you get a different interpretation of those uh, data. So the, the higher the number in relativism, uh, the more people think that uh, it's, uh, it's not that much of a problem. Yes. Okay. Yes, exactly. Got it. Um, then we have like a, a measure of institutional distance or skepticism, I should call it here. Uh, we ask people also, please tell me for each of the following institutions how much you trust them. And, it, and the list includes everything from national government, parliament, the church, companies, banks, uh, trade unions, uh, television, print media, a whole long list. Um, but we figured that um, institutions that represent vertical authority, and that would include the police, the courts, and the army, uh, those three, we summarize. And we call, call it skepticism when people express distrust into those institutions. So that's a distance from those institutions' authority. Dominic, uh, I would like to ask how the, uh, how the numbers on the, on the right side were drawn. Because uh, the left, uh, I get it that uh, there was uh, the responses on, uh, uh, on the, the topics uh, like uh, individually. But, uh, the numbers on the right is the, the one that the group, three of them uh, together, but then the... You mean those numbers? Yeah, because uh, the values here are very di uh, different from the ones uh, on the left, so... Um, yes. Um, this is... Um, so now, to answer this question, I have to um, explain you a little bit about factor analysis. I don't know if you have uh, heard anything about it in your methods class. Uh, factor analysis is a tool where you, so, um, think of those 12 items before we do any uh, manipulation, what you, uh, but you have an idea that they belong together under, under an umbrella theme. What you then want to know, by the means of statistics, you want to know if the if certain groups of items emerge that cluster together uh, more tightly than others. And the factor analysis will show you how many clusters do I get out. So in the beginning, we have 12 items, and you, you chase them through a factor analysis, and you ask this factor analysis to tell me how many cluster I, clusters of items do I have, and you get four. So 12 items cluster into four groups on the first day, and those are the clusters. And then you have to think how you interpret those clusters and, and then you decide which label you put on them. Uh -huh. In the second step, then I created those items, so I have a score on the files, agnosticism, relativism, skepticism, all between zero and one for every individual. But now I have not 12 measures anymore, but only four that, that group them together into four clusters, and now I rank another factor analysis over those four clusters in order to see whether on a higher level of abstraction, the four then create one beta cluster at the higher level. And that is exactly the case 
and that justifies by statistical means to summarize those four then into one index. Because at this level, and this is, these are the so-called factor loadings, when they are above 0.4, then they are good. And that tells you it is justified to summarize those four into one index. So it's actually two steps of aggregation. First, I summarize 12 items into four, and then I summarize the four into a single one. It was like uh, one of the question, uh, like the question that you uh, told us about uh, when they asked uh, again after the, they were moved uh, together. Because, no. Because, like, for example, with uh, the one, uh, the three uh, that uh, we have in the files, like, they all have a, a result of uh, 0.68, but after they were grouped, uh, it has uh, 0.78. So I don't understand how. Uh, how did they how did hire? How did the result change? Um, it's different. Uh, um, here, when I throw 12 um, items into a popular analysis, it appears uh, often four, the numbers will change. Because these factor logics depend on the number of items that are under consideration. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, it's actually not important to know these numbers. Uh, the important thing to know is that. We get clusters of items that we then can decide to summarize into smaller and in the end a single index that measures circular values. Yeah. Okay. Um, Now you can imagine a, co a popular. So what? When we calculate, okay, the, the two thousand respondents in Indian have been asked, and each individual has a score on emancipated values. And now I calculate for all the two thousand Indians that you have interviewed the average of the population. Um, how the, the key question then is: Does such an average not hide more than it reveals? Because the same average can uh, come from a situation in which you have people all the way on the left and all the way on the right, and the average is in the middle. Uh, but the same average can also occur if the two polar poles are closer to each other, and get, still get the same average. So the average might hide uh, different distributional features. And for averages, or let me say it, uh, the arithmetic mean, uh, is in statistics usually considered the central tendency. So the central tendency of a population in the assumption is, when we talk about the central tendency, is, thus, is that the individuals, even though they are different and spread a little bit over the scale, of course, they will not all be on the averages here. But the idea of the central tendency is nevertheless that the average is a good representative of the central tendency, which means that there is a clustering around that average to the effect that the more I move away from that average, either to the left or to the right, the less frequently I, I meet people there. So that means that the, the, the bulk of the population should cluster around the average, despite individual differences, and I should have a distribution that is, we call it single peaked. It has only one peak, and that peak is identical with the average. The opposite situation would be what we call the bimodal distribution, where I have two peaks in the distribution, and then they are far apart, one close to the, uh, to the lower end of the scale and the other close to the upper end of the scale. Such a situation is actually imaginable for societies that are highly unequal or polarized. When you think of Brazil has one of the, the worst Gini coefficients in the world, meaning the income distribution in Brazil is highly unequal. So you can imagine there is a lot of people poor, also, but also a lot of people rich, and that might also be reflected in a distribution of values, that there are two peaks. 
And the average would nevertheless be in the middle, but the average would in this case, in such a bimodal distribution, not be a good representative of the central tendency, because there is no central tendency when I have two peaks instead of one. So it was very important to look, um, when we look at the distribution of individuals within countries, if the averages are good representatives of the central tendency, in which case we should, should see clustered distributions and only one peak. And uh, when we looked at example cases in different parts of the world, and it's exactly uh, pretty much what we find. It's always uh, clustered in the middle and only one peak in the distribution, and that is in all these cases identical with the overall average. And it does not matter if that society is in the Middle East, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South Asia, in South America, in East Asia, in Southern Europe, in East Asia again, in Eastern Europe, or in the North, in the North, in Scandinavia. Always the same pattern by the distribution. So we can say um, the, the, the average scores when higher populations are good representatives of the central tendency, therefore, these means are meaningful. And it's, it's, uh, it's legitimate to work with them as a tool of research. Now, uh, I know I finish. Um, Here you can see secular values, and here emancipative values. They're both on the same scale. Uh, theoretically, from 0 to 1.0 with anything in between. But of course, you would not find a society at the absolute extreme end, so at 0 or 1.0 exactly. And um, yeah, you see that all the scales are filled with cases. And what do you see when you look at that picture? How many stories come to mind? How many patterns do you see? I put in bold uh, letters the countries that are population-wise the biggest ones in their respective area. So Russia. Japan, France, Germany, here's Poland, it's this one. It is interesting to see in our analyses, um, Poland is, is never with the other uh, Eastern European countries in its vicinity, it's always with Latin American countries. And that might be because of the strong Catholic, Catholicism. Culture-wise, Poland does not lie uh, in Central Europe, but in South America. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay, this is homework. So the, big, big, the next session we go back exactly to those pictures, to this here in particular, and then we talk further about this, and you can think a little bit what comes to mind when we look at it. Okay. Any more questions? Document. Is my pace okay, or should I, or too too fast, too slow? No, it's no, no, it's okay. good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks for your attention. It was fun, and I'm looking forward to the next sessions. <laughs>